So this is, um, um, this is, as I mentioned, this is a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. You know, um, we're really, you know, I, and this is work that we've been doing for the last few years um, where I, you know, I, I want to have these strong desires to kind of fundamentally change in what we're doing in routine audiology practice. So the title of this is, is using speech and noise to probe auditory function in the routine audiogram. And I could even say, you know, man, potentially maybe beyond, you know, realistically with this as well. So, um, so with this, why don't I get started? Leave with the basics here. I have a, um, I have no conflicts of interest. This is research that was funded entirely by Stanford um, at this point. So, um, so what, why don't we begin? Okay, so first things first, let's see. Let's go for, yep. So I wanna, you know, if we're talking about using speech and noise to probe auditory function, and that really that concept of auditory function is really um, um, central to my heart, because I really think ultimately it's gonna drive a lot of what we do in audiology, a lot of why patients make the decisions that they do, okay? And if we take a step back, kind of like zoom back about 50, 60, 70 years, you know, you look at just what audiology is on a historic basis, you know, and of course it's, diagnosis and management to hearing and balance disorders, okay? And, you know, everyone, people in this room have either completed audiograms or you're referring for audiograms. And these tests are the pretty much are largely diagnostic in nature. And of course, then we provide rehabilitative services via hearing aids and cochlear implants. But even like the, the, the history of audiology is very, very diagnostic focused. I mean, um, I don't know if many of you in this room know, but audiologists actually could not dispense hearing aids until the late 1970s. Okay, so the field existed for for thirty odd some years before audiologists could even really engage in a, in a lot of rehabilitative activities. So, so the diagnostic work really is focused on two variables. Of course, there is hearing threshold, and then a lot of work for many 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 years is focused on sight lesion. So, i.e., kind of where is the problem? Now, the thing that I would I would say that argue that the current framework for audiology and what we do on a day to day basis just doesn't capture very much beyond the whole concept of can you hear it, okay? Um, and this is important because I think, again, these sorts of things drive practice. I mean, you talk to any physician, you talk to any audiologist, and often we kind of have an informal sense of when somebody, an adult or a child might have an issue beyond hearing that could be influencing their performance, okay? But we don't have a lot of good ways really to quantify that or to quantify their um, effects on what we're doing and the tests we're measuring in our current test battery. And again, I think that comes back to that, you know, longstanding historical emphasis on hearing threshold um, and, and on kind of these side lesion sorts of measures that really hasn't kept pace with changes in medical practice, okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit more, for example, when I start talking about what uh, certain performance looks like in patients with vestibular schwannomas. Okay, so if you go big, big, big picture, I say, regardless of what we've been doing for decades, you know, what, what, what I think should, things should look like. And there's kind of a, a, a three question framework that I like to view for the future of diagnostic audiology, okay? So the first course, the, the thing that we have to ask in any situation is how well does somebody hear, okay? That's absolutely crucial. That is central job. If you can't do this, nothing else matters. You know, and that goes back to the classic audiometric gold standard, you know, listen to the thresholds, what people think about when you're referring in for a hearing tests. And that's absolutely necessary for medical and rehabilitative management. But the thing is, this doesn't really capture function. All right, this doesn't really get at the whole part of the equation, okay? Um, it does not, your ability to, to tell how what someone hears doesn't tell how someone functions with the hearing. And I think it's a question that we need to be looking at um, and pivoting the audiology test battery toward really addressing while still making sure we get the information we need. Because you know these sorts of measures of function drive when patients walk in the door. Okay, when patients feel like they can't, they don't know necessarily if they have hearing loss, but they do know if they have difficulty communicating in the day to day life, particularly in adverse listening situations. All right. And the thing is, these measures of function, as I'm going to show you, you can't predict it from the audiogram. You can't just look at somebody's hearing thresholds and say, okay, well, they're, they're, they're doing well, they're not functioning well. Okay. The, your hearing thresholds are only indirectly related to your ability to function with your degree of hearing. Okay, and I'm going to show you later that I would argue that by making this pivot toward looking at how well someone functions with the hearing actually makes us more sensitive to pathologies and other aspects um, than our traditional test battery. Okay, and then the third question, I think that we, this is really kind of in the future, but I think it's something we as audiologists and scientists always need to be aware of. It's not just how well can you hear, it's not just how well can you function with the hearing, but how hard do you have to work to get there? All right. 
So this whole concept of listening effort is really important. It's, it's a new area of study, but it's a big part of the patient experience. You know, patients with hearing loss are tired at the end of the day. You know, and this is something that if you talk to patients, you know, they're going to say these sorts of things to you again and again and again. And I think we, when we start looking at the, you know, current and the future diagnostic audiology, we want to make sure we can try, ideally try to capture that as well. Now, what I'm going to um, say, you know, suggest to you is that the, the key to addressing, you know, questions two and three are really the integration of tests of auditory function. Okay. And that's crucial to make those things because I think that in doing that is allows us going to tap into variables that can influence patient performance again, beyond hearing alone, these sorts of things we wonder about, but we have a chance of starting to quantify. And I think doing that's going to allow us to better characterize patient performance and their motivations and ultimately lead toward better patient management, which is what it's really all about. Okay. So I've said this here kind of as a rough intro. Now, how do we actually assess function in routine audiologic practice? Okay. So there's two methods really or approaches, I would say, I think I would argue that are available to assess auditory function. And, you know, the first is electrophysiology. And the second is speech and noise measures, okay? Now, I'm only gonna talk very briefly about physiology, electrophysiology today, just to let you know that this is there, we're aware of it. And this is a topic that's actively, um, um, that is under investigation in our lab. Now, what people most commonly think of when they think of um, auditory um, electrophysiology or, um, is, is the ABR. Okay, and this is our gold standard for assessing um, hearing in infants, young children, or adults who cannot respond behaviorally. So again, remember we've got our, um, um, this is brainstem evoked potential. We got a uh, wave one, which is thought to be the synapse of the inner hair cells on the auditory nerve, waves three and wave five. The, the amplitude and latency of wave five is kind of what's largely used to determine hearing threshold. Okay, and ABRs are awesome. I love ABRs, they're spectacular things for determining hearing threshold, but they're actually kind of poorly suited for related to if you're looking at how we function uh, beyond how well you can hear, except maybe wave one amplitude in cases of cochlear synaptopathy. Now, there are other measures of physiologic um, uh, function that we can, that audiologists have, have access to or will have access to if I have my way and say. Um, for example, one of the things that our lab is currently working on um, is using something called the frequency following response, okay, which is basically the ability of your brainstem to phase lock to the period of a stimulus waveform, okay. And the strength of this is related to your ability to understand speech and noise. Um, we've published data showing that in infants, it's related to the level of bilirubin in the bloodstream. It's thought to be related to language delays, things of this sort, okay? And, and we are currently in the process of investigating these sorts of issues. Um, so these are things that are doing, but this isn't, um, um, again, this is only, some, we're not doing ABR or FFR sorts of measures on every patient that walks in the door. We're only doing this, um, but something that we can do on virtually everybody that walks in the door is speech and noise testing. Okay, and I think that speech and noise is an optimal way to probe auditory function, okay, both in adults and in children, okay, and I think if someone can respond behaviorally, we should probably be doing speech and noise measures on them if at all possible. Now, when we look at auditory function right now in our current clinical protocols, it's largely done with word recognition and quiet, and that's been the case for 70 years. All right, you know, the default test of speech perception for since, you know, it's in late 1948 was when um, um, Egan published the, the first um, uh, PB lists. Okay, so long, long, long time ago. But I would argue that actually testing in quiet in this way is suboptimal for many reasons. Um, your first is your performance is largely driven by hearing thresholds. Okay, so if I know what your audiogram is, I can largely pretty much for most of the time, I can pretty much predict exactly what your speech understanding scores in quiet are going to look like. Um, more important, it's not, it, it, there's no relationship between that and how people feel like they function in the day-to-day -day world. And I would argue that it's actually insensitive to many auditory pathologies, okay? So this is what we're doing currently right here. The thing is, you know, patients come into the clinic and they say, you know, I can't hear a noise. So what happens, they say, well, I know you're having trouble in background noise. We're going to put you in this nice, quiet, sound-treated room like this thing I got right behind me here my, in my lovely sound booth here. And I'm going to tell you, say the word bass. So there's this massive disconnect between a patient says the problem is and what current clinical practice is. And anytime you see that, I view that's an opportunity for improvement. All right. And to underscore this point, you know, realistically, it's a, a um, is that, you know, you can have real problems understanding speech and noise, despite having no difficulty at all understanding speech and quiet. 
All right, so this is data from um, over 5,800 patients right here. Let me walk you through this. We've got um, um, on the x-axis here, we've got your classic word recognition score that everyone um, here, whether audiologist or physician is trained to think about or look at. Okay, what's your percent correct on this measure? You know, on the y-axis here, we have something called your quicksend, which is you basically, um, 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 this is a test, a speech and noise test where we vary what's called the signal to noise ratio meaning how loud is a signal relative to the background noise, okay? We vary the signal noise ratio. And it's basically the output of this is the signal noise ratio at which um, a patient can identify 50% of keywords in these sentences, okay? And what you can see, so better performance on the quick sin is lower numbers, worse performance on a quick sin is higher numbers. So in this case, somebody would have to have the signal to noise ratio, the signal be 20 dB louder than the background noise for to get 50% correct. So what you can find here is you got lots of patients that have no trouble at all whatsoever in quiet, okay? Some of these people do just fine in background noise. We have lots of patients that have mild, moderate, even severe deficits in background noise, okay? And again, so the mind, this really kind of speaks to the idea of like um, what patients are saying is right and maybe what we're doing isn't really capturing that because patients come in all the time and say, I have, I have trouble in background noise. But the vast, you know, over our data, when we look across, you know, 30,000 autograms we've done in our clinic, you know, close to 90% of patients have a word recognition score that's about 90% or better. So again, huge disconnect between what patient says their problem is. And if you actually start measuring what the speech and noise scores look like, you see we're missing it. You know, we're, you know, and that's why it's important to actually be looking at these speech and noise measures. Okay. Now, you know, another thing when I talk about word recognition scores, another thing to think about or actually be aware of is yes, they get worse with hearing loss, but that, you know, your performance is still pretty good even when you have a lot of hearing loss. So what I've got is individual data points uh, plotted for, for varying categories of hearing loss, ranging from perfectly normal hearing, borderline normal, mild, moderate, moderately severe, and severe to profound. And each circle represents an individual data point. The solid black line here represents what the, what the kind of mean score is for this. And what you could see here is, you know, even out through patients with moderate hearing losses, if you make the gosh darn thing loud enough, they still are scoring over 90% on average, okay? So again, this thing in quiet isn't really sensitive to, to, um, to the pathology, you know, that's driving it in the first place. Um, but it's a different story when we start looking at noise, okay? So again, here, what I'm plotting is we've got on your x-axis here, we've got your high frequency peer tone average. Here, we've got your quicks and SNR loss, you know? And again, normal performance is anything above this dotted line. So here, we've even got people with rock normal hearing. I can tell you our data show that one out of three people with a peer tone average of less than 15 has a documented deficit understanding speech and noise. Okay, a lot of variability in here clearly. Okay, but there's clear decrements, you know, that you can see as the increased amount of hearing loss performance tends to get worse. And if I plot it like this again, um, you know, these speech and noise measures, they decrease with hearing loss as well. And these decreases start happening earlier than what we see with quiet. You know, in quiet, things really didn't get below 90% correct, i.e. kind of an excellent level of performance until um, you had basically moderate severe loss. I mean, here, if you look at patients, even with a mild hearing loss, you know, their average question score is about 5 dB, okay, which is indicative of a problem. So we, again, when we start testing patients in noise, we start seeing things we're not picking up by testing in quiet. Now, most important for clinical practice, all right, um, is, you know, you say, well, if I want to be testing in noise, okay, but I don't have time to test the noise and test it quiet, is that actually we can predict which patients are going to have problems in quiet, all right, by looking at your speech and noise performance, by looking at this measure of auditory function. So again, so here I've got your right ear. Again, this is your high frequency peer tone average. We've got good, low, really good hearing over here, worse hearing over here. We got your Quixen SNR loss, good performance up top, poor performance in the bottom. And here we've broken into patients who yeah, have word, nice rec listening to grand rounds. word recognition scores less than 75% or recognition scores greater than 76%. Okay. And what you can see is pretty much anybody that has problems understanding speech and quiet almost invariably has more trouble understanding speech and noise and has more hearing loss. Okay. And that's almost universally true. Pretty much. If you can't function in quiet, you've got more hearing loss. You've got more trouble in background noise. Converse of these people who are doing just fine and quiet, um, the vast majority of these people, of course, have less hearing loss and less trouble in background noise. 
And we still got a few people that, that, that kind of fall in this category. But, you know, anyone, basically, if you can't function in quiet, you certainly can't function in noise. And you've got some hearing loss as well. Now, I could tell you, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you all the details of the statistical model. I can tell you that, that basically our sensitivity and specificity values are at 90 to 95%, which is extraordinarily high for clinical thing. We're basically, we're going to identify categories of whether you've got good word rec score, or whether you've got a bad word, or have the potential to have a bad word rec score. Okay. And we're going to argue um, that, that basically the default test, you know, at least in adults should be to just start to lead with a quick set, not even do word rec at all. And you're only going to do word rec that's likely to be poor. And the same way that all of you physicians, you know, you don't order an MRI that everyone that comes in the door, you only order an MRI if you think there's likely to be a problem. And I would argue that by testing patients in background noise, getting this measure of function or realistic measure of function that we can get basically predict, you know, or triage, you know, who needs to be tested and quiet, who doesn't need to be tested and quiet. Okay. And again, we're extraordinarily accurate. And these sorts of categories right here, you know, we're not, we're not missing implant candidates like this by utilizing this sort of thing. Okay. Um, so the bottom line, and I'll tell you, um, um, is I think utilizing, um, these sorts of uh, protocols of kind of when do you test in quiet or, uh, or versus not, you know, we've got data-driven guidelines, data-driven recommendations in this regard. And by making this pivot, we can make sure that the routine audiogram is more sensitive to the concerns raised by the patient. I have a sip of water here. The thing is, this allows us to open doors to look at other aspects of auditory function. Because I'd say that speech noise is more sensitive to auditory function than testing and quiet. And I'm going to show you this again over the next few, um, over the next several slides, basically how we can use speech noise measures to pick apart different aspects of auditory function and gain additional information. All right. So let's start with the, you know, we'll talk about the effects of pathology. We're going to talk about the effects of perceived handicap. So how patients think they're doing in the day to day life. We'll talk about the effects of um, aging. We'll talk about cognitive decline. Okay, listing effort, things of this, and give some direction for the future as to where to go. But let's first, let's take a look at, at, at pathology um, with stimulus schwannomas, okay? And this is an area that's a very high interest for, for uh, particularly for otology and neurotology friends. Um, now, if you ask audiologists and you ask physicians, though, they say, well, what happens if somebody's got a schwannoma? They say, well, your speech understanding score is worse. Okay, that's kind of the default reflexive response that we get. Now, you know, our, our, our um, illustrious chair, uh, you know, Tina, you know, she's got, got amazing data showing that some patients do well, some patients do not well. And what I love about her work is she's really starting to identify or tease out those factors that are associated with poor performance. Okay, so even though, so I think, you know, there's an assumption that things deteriorate. It's more like the possibility that something might, might get worse in this regard, that your word rec score would be worse. Okay, but even before you document a schwannoma, you got to decide, who do I send on? Who do I need to go see um, Dr. Stankovich or any one of our physicians, you know? And often people will look at your word rec scores. And this is, this is fascinating. This is a great quote from, from, from Don Dirks, one of the uh, legends of audiology um, published in 1977. He said, the use of speech discrimination scores, AKA word recognition scores for differential diagnosis of retrochocal pathology has never been highly successful because of substantial overlap in scores among patients with cochlear and eighth nerve disorders. Okay. So again, you know, th this default assumption that kind of reflexively that we have um, actually, you know, um, they've known, we've known for, for almost 50 years that that's not necessarily true. Okay. Um, now, you know, my talk that audiology is very focused on cytolesin measures, you know, a lot of that's because, you know, back in the day, did, they didn't, you know, in the early seventies, they didn't have MRI. So they go through a lot of efforts to try and find out which patients actually um, might be at, at, at uh, risk for, for a schwannoma. So we, you know, we, the, who needs to be sent on for medical management at that point? So they use different, you know, even knowing that like a single word recognition list doesn't really tell you very much. Their ideas of looking at something called rollover, which is where basically your speech or your word recognition score gets worse as the intensity gets louder. And uh, so Jurger and Dirks basically demonstrated that your rollover ratio um, which is basically your PB max, your highest word rec score minus your minimum divided by the PB max, that can separate um, theoretically um, who's got a uh, schwannoma and who doesn't, okay? The thing is to actually do this takes six to eight word lists, you know, to do it properly. And, and I am um, 
maybe George Chirago might be the only person here who might have sent somebody down the hall to have him do six day word list to identify, you know, whether or not somebody might might have an accurate rollover ratio that could do it. But that's, you know, in modern medicine, you know, um, you know, the idea of looking for rollover just doesn't isn't there. It's like if you got a question, you send them on for an MRI. So, you know, the question is, well, you know, can we use if we start using speech and noise to probe this issue? Instead of testing quiet, can we help us resolve some of these issues? Do we get more sensitive? Okay. And actually, one of the things that's striking is vestibular schwannomas have a larger effect on speech and noise performance. Okay. Actually, much larger effect. Um, so, you know, here again, what we're plotting, we've got word recognition and quiet. We've got speech and noise performance. So, again, so this is the ear with schwannoma from good performance to poor performance. We've got uh, performance in the in the contralateral ear. Okay, so again, good performance at the bottom to poor performance, and then we've got patients broken into um, different um, gradations of word recognition score, kind of that often utilized widely in the um, um, otology literature. Okay, and so basically, you know, category one is basically anything like seventy percent or higher, and what's telling is is you know of patients who basically had a word rec score. This is in our, our um, data for taken at Stanford with patients with seventy three uh, schwannomas. And what was striking is that, you know, 70% of these, you know, um, you know only 23% had a word rec score less than 73, less than 70%. Okay. So most of these people still had pretty good word recognition scores in that year. Now, in contrast, you know, 56% of the patients um, with the schwannoma had a significant speech and noise deficit. And we can see that over here. So basically, we got a mild speech and noise deficit, moderate, and then severe over here. And, you know, so over half of the patients are falling in this moderate to severe range, okay? And frankly, um, um, only one out of four, uh, or, you know, le less than um, um, one out of, maybe like one out of five patients um, with, had actual normal speech and noise abilities in this side. Um, I could tell you from looking at these data, these people almost universally also had normal hearing in that ear. So something completely different is picking it up. So if we want to probe um, pathology, we are actually kind of more effective when we start looking um, using speech and noise measures than we are by testing in quiet. Okay, and I can tell you if we built a good statistical model on this, and 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 actually um, our data suggests that the um, using uh, speech noise asymmetry at five to six dB um, is actually more sensitive even than using a peritone asymmetry and identifying these patients who might have an issue. Okay, now we can look at speech and noise to probe other parts of auditory function. For example, how well does someone think they're doing in their day to day life? Um, and so, one of the things that you see here, so we can use this through questionnaire based measures. So, this is like, I, I, I'll, I'll leave with this. So, this is something called an SSQ, which is basically a questionnaire that rates on a scale of one to 10. How do you feel like you're, you're functioning in different acoustic environments? They got a number of questions like that. And here we've got uh, varying levels of quicksand, SNR loss. So, if I just plot the, the ubiquitous error bars like this, you say, well, you know, your speech noise abilities line up perfectly with whether or not you, how well people think they're doing. So, if you get worse speech and noise abilities, and you feel like you're really having a problem. Now, the problem, of course, is there's reality. And so these um, sorts of plots like this don't necessarily reflect reality, whereas you know, <laughs> reality with, with, with these sorts of uh, uh, questionnaire-based measures are extraordinarily noisy, where, yes, we have a same like you know, people with perfectly normal speech noise abilities might still have a normal um, rating on the SSQ, but some of these people have um, really, really good SSQ scores, and some of these people feel like they can't function at all. And we do have a statistically significant relationship here, but we're only picking up about 25, 30% of variance by look in, in perceived handicap by looking at your speech and noise score. Now we pick up a similar amount of variance if we start looking at hearing loss, okay? And if you notice actually the relationship between hearing loss um, and, and perceived, um, perceived handicap is actually pretty similar. Again, as hearing loss goes down, you know, our hearing loss increases and your perceived handicap goes, goes up, okay? Meaning that the scores get lower. But if I start looking at people in quiet here, well, suddenly again, we're running into issues where um, one, part of the problem is that everybody does well in quiet, you know, and when we look at this statistically, there's no real relationship between your performance in quiet and how people feel like they're doing on their day-to-day -day life as opposed to a questionnaire. Okay. And when we applied a statistical model to this, basically, it was really kind of consistent with that idea. You know, your pure tone average, your quicksand score, you know, and age to a smaller extent, these were all significant predictors of what your, your rating was on this pre measured perceived handicap. Whereas, you know, word rec really had no effect on the predictive power of this model. So again, really fitting with the idea that even if I just look at your speech and noise score, that I can probe another part of how people feel like they're doing in their day-to-day -day life. What about the effects of age? 
Okay, this is another kind of striking part right here. Um, now, the default assumption again, if you ask people, say, well, of course, your speech understanding abilities get worse as you get older. And what I'm going to tell you is that that is true in noise, um, but that it is not true in quiet once you count for the effects of hearing loss. Okay, okay, thank you very much here. Okay, so let's come back to, to this here again. Now, what I can tell you is that once we get into to, um, start looking at the effects of age um, in quiet, there's actually no longer any effect of age on speech understanding in quiet once we account for hearing loss. Okay, so again, so again, we, what you'll see here, notice that the slope of these regression lines are pretty much exactly flat, no matter how much hearing loss we've got. Okay, and none of these, and I can tell you that the, the difference between the slope of these regression lines and the slope of these regression lines is statistically significant at all levels. And so the implication being is that once you control for age, you know, or once you control for hearing loss, there's no effect of age in quiet. But when we test the noise, we can start to probe and see what these effects of age look like. Okay, so I'll, I'll tell you, you know, like um, on a big, big, big picture level, you know, we are going to um, transition completely to speech and noise, hopefully at the end of this year. Um, I've got currently have five manuscripts under review at Aaron Hearing, basically kind of laying out the argument, everything you need for clinical practice to make these sorts of changes, because I would argue that the whole thing is more sensitive to that. Um, but I think doing this, um, we can move beyond. Okay, there's other things we can um, be looking at in this regard. Okay, and I think that that ultimately in the long run, that looking, converting, and utilizing speech and noise in your day-to-day -day measures are going to allow us to better say, say for example, which patients are likely to have a deficit in neural encoding, which patients might be at risk for a cognitive issue, and to give us an index or an assay of listening effort. All right. So let's talk a little bit about each one of these factors here, just to kind of give you a preview of kind of where things are going. Um, now, the reason why I think that speech noise abilities will be able to do these sorts of things and that we can incorporate these in routine practice is just because of what it takes to function in noise. Okay. Now, the classic framework for understanding speech noise is this. Say, first, you got to hear it. Okay. And if you can't hear the gosh darn thing, then nothing else really matters. And for testing and quiet, this is probably 90% of the game right here. Um, but with when you're testing a noise, this is actually really only about 50% of the game. And 50% of the game then are what Plomp called distortion, which is basically kind of factors beyond audibility. Okay. And that can refer to peripheral encoding issues. Okay. So kind of sort of bottom up sorts of things. Or we could talk about executive function issues, top down sorts of things. And the fact that different ways of different measures, I'll tell you, of speech and noise tests can be particularly sensitive, say, toward top down issues or bottom up issues and things going beyond just can you hear the gosh darn thing. So let's look at the hot topic of the day, okay, which is, um, um, you know, how well um, are the issues of cognitive decline as people get older, okay? Now, think about this. Um, you know, when I mentioned this, there's factors beyond audibility, your peripheral bottom-up encoding, your top-down issues. These factors matter a lot because if you take patients with the same amount of hearing loss right here, some of these people do really, really, really well. Some of these people do really, really, really poorly. So the implication is if you've got similar amounts of hearing loss, but you're down here versus up here, this is likely either reflecting some sort of peripheral deficit, central deficit, or both, okay? And as I mentioned, one of the big issues of the day, of course, is um, 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 cognitive decline as, as um, uh, untreated, um, untreated hearing loss is a big predictor of cognitive decline. And one of the things that, you know, the thing is they found like everybody with hearing loss develops issues with cognitive decline. So we're trying to tease out, okay, which patients might be at risk? And I speculated these people down here. And we've got some data supporting that idea. So now if I go back and do our classic, you know, um, you know, word recognition and quiet. And what we did is we pulled with through our data. Um, we found about 230 patients who have a diagnosis of sort of, sort of mild cognitive impairment, whether that's Alzheimer's, whether that's dementia, whether that's um, some sort of MCI. Okay. So then we went back through and pulled um, mm -hmm. yes, patients who have um, okay. no diagnosis of cognitive decline. We stripped out any sort of vascular issues, anything like that. And first, we're comparing these patients to quiet. So, like, um, what we could see is that regardless of what type of hearing loss we've got, okay, the performance in quiet is pretty similar across these groups. So, patients with uh, mild hearing loss do just, you know, um, you know, have similar issues, whether you've got no cognitive issue or with a significant cognitive issue. Same thing here. We have moderate hearing loss. Again, we're about a little over 90%, right about 90%. So you can't tell a patient with a cognitive impairment 
versus a non-cognitive issue, okay, um, by looking at quiet, all right? And that's, a, again, so once you control for the degree of hearing loss, you can't tell them apart. But what's striking is when we start testing people in background noise, now we start to see differences in performance. And this is the only thing we do audiologically that can separate a patient with a cognitive issue versus patient without that. So with what you can see here is on average, these patients who have a cognitive impairment, okay, perform about one to two dB, about one and a half to two dB worse on the quicksin than their peers without that. So for example, take a patient with a mild hearing loss. The average um, um, quicksin score here is about five. Here we're at seven. If you look at a patient with a moderate loss, here we're right about eight. Here we're about 10, okay? So what you can see is consistently performance is always shifted down. And this is the only thing that we do on a clinical basis, okay? Um, that can really separate a patient that might have a cognitive issue from might without, okay? And I can tell you that the, the way to make these sort of processes more sensitive is something that we're actively, um, is an active topic investigation in my lab. Now, other factors here, we can do the same sorts of issues with children. Okay, and these same sorts of factors. So we'll highlight some of the, the work from, uh, from Christy Ward. Uh, Christy was my research fellow last year. She did a fellowship on the clinical and the research end with us. And we were fortunate enough to retain her. She's uh, seeing patients right now as a clinical audiologist and also uh, working on the research end as well. So really kind of a, a true dual threat. And Christy's a real rising star in our field. And one of the things that Christy demonstrated in her dissertation is again, this strong relationship between these sorts of executive function issues and your speech and noise performance. So in her case, she was, um, wasn't looking at patients with a cognitive issue, she's looking at kids and looking at the selective attention abilities. What they found is that kids who had better selective attention had better speech understanding, and kids with worse attentional abilities had poorer speech understanding, all right? So again, really demonstrating that we might be able to probe, use speech and noise to probe, not just uh, um, for which maybe which kids are at risk for some sort of, of, of executive function or cognitive issue, you know, attentional issues, whatever, you know, that could benefit from referral out to, to other healthcare professionals. So it's kind of one of these another future things. So we're working on this in the adult end, we're working on this in the pediatric end here with Christy. Okay, let's go to another kind of like what sorts of things might be happening in the future. And again, the idea of using speech and noise to promote listening effort, to probe listening effort. Okay, so this is work from uh, Sumya Venkita Krishnan. Sumya is my current research fellow. She's almost an AD PhD. Um, and Sumya is in her dissertation work, she's looking at listening effort as a function when you start varying the signal to noise ratio, i.e. your speech and noise task. And one of the things that Sumya finds is basically, so your listening effort rating. So this is like, you know, I'm doing just fine. This is like, my effort is really, really, really hard, okay? And you could find that first, you know, people with normal hearing have report less listening effort than people with hearing loss, okay? But as we make the signal noise ratio worse and worse, i.e. making the speech and noise task harder, you can see that the amount of listening effort goes up and people just feel like they're working harder and harder and harder. And people with hearing loss really fall off a cliff kind of right off the bat when you start going from quiet to noise and people with normal hearing, you know, they, 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 they fall apart, start to fall apart too. Okay, but they really start to fall apart when you get to very adverse signal noise ratios. So again, this suggests that again, if we wanna be looking at listening effort, how hard does somebody have to work? We're gonna to have to be doing it by looking at speech and noise measures. Okay, now it, a topic that's of high interest to our physiology partners here um, in basic science labs at Stanford um, is you know, the concept of cochlear synaptopathy. And just to basically remind you, you know, the idea that you know, when someone is exposed to very loud noise, Okay, that one of the things that can happen is the first thing that, well, even before you lose your hearing, is we start to lose some of these synapses that connect to the inner hair cell that results in a degeneration of the nerve fiber. Okay, and so one of the, the um, hallmarks, or thought to be a hallmark, at least in humans, is that this should manifest in terms of a speech and noise deficit. Okay, and I would I speculate that within the next few years, we'll be able to, um, um, to tease, to start to tease this out a little bit more. There's a great review published actually literally just a few weeks ago from um, Michelle Danino, you know, Michelle Danino and uh, Barb Shin Cunningham looking at what sorts of speech and noise tests might be more sensitive to this. Because some speech and noise tests, um, the, because the data are all over the place in terms of humans, but what they find is these sorts of sentence based tests, say like a quicksin, that seem to be good for these central executive function issues, okay, um, they have more of a cognitive contribution are probably suboptimal for synaptic thing. 
And if you want to be looking at these sorts of synaptic issues, we want to basically be picking tests with minimal semantic cues, so whether words or even phonemes with very low signal noise ratios. And if I kind of peer in my crystal ball, I say, well, you know, I, my hope is that we get to a world with it within audiology to where one speech and noise is the default. But when we start picking our speech and noise test, depending upon what sort we think the pathology is, okay? So if we're concerned about some sort of executive function issue or about how people um, relating to back to how people are doing in their day-to-day -day life or listening efforts sort of thing, we might be picking something with, um, um, you know, some sort of context or semantic, semantic factor. Converse, if we got somebody with really good hearing, but they still feel like they're having difficulty understanding speech and noise, we probably pick a test with less context, more phonemes, low signal noise ratios. And we start tailoring the approach really to what the needs of the patient are. So, you know, we're moving toward that in audiology. Um, what I'm gonna to say to you kind of in closing here is I, I really feel like that the way to, in, in audiology, we need to make sure that we start pivoting away from only focusing on threshold and we gotta focus on function as well. Okay, and the optimal way to be looking at function, okay, is speech and noise measures, okay? It just gives information the word rec cannot, and it's more sensitive to pathology. And, and again, I really think that this is the path forward for us kind of moving beyond. I mean, ultimately hearing loss affects people in a myriad and profound number of ways. Again, whether from the cognitive decline, language delay, all sorts of things. And so I think we can use these sorts of measures to potentially have a data-driven way to flag children or adults who are at risk, for some sort of executive function issue. I think maybe to have a data-driven way that doesn't necessarily require going back in for ABR to identify synaptopathy related disorder, you know, and to really get good measures of listening effort. So with that, I think I'll stop, um, say thank you for my technical interruption between two and, and thank you to all my, my staff. I have an amazing staff of audiologists at the Ear Institute, both on the pediatric side and the adult side. And I'm very fortunate just to work with an outstanding team of audiologists and physicians here. So it's a privilege and, um, Thank you very much. Matt, that's a wonderful talk. I have a question. Please. I mean, it almost seems like this is like a, could be used as a cognitive function test on top of a hearing test. Yeah. So have you seen, I mean, I think a test for an ADHD kid would be very different from a Cognitive test from an Alzheimer patient. Yeah. Like, do you see this? Do you number one? I guess do you see some improvement in their function sometimes after they have treatment. Number one, and number two, how do you see this? How have uh, other, I guess, cognitive psychologists seen this test as being beneficial? Yeah. So you know, the, first regarding the question of treatment, I mean. Some people have, you know, there's a there's very limited data to suggest whether you see improvements in executive function, whether adults or kids, after treatment with hearing aids or cochlear implants. Okay, and that's really kind of one of the sixty four thousand dollar question that's out there. I mean, that's 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 what people want to know is 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 the, how much of a difference does that make? Um, the data are limited. The data are all over the place. And the question, of course, the first part is like tying some of that back to just like you know, can you hear the gosh darn thing? Because, you know, the fastest way for somebody to fail like a cognitive test or some other measure is to not be able to hear the questions. You know, I speculate that that uh, um, I think that that to really do our job properly on this, to really refer accordingly or to assess those sorts of facts that we as audiologists have to get more sophisticated about picking our tools. You know, and that's one of the things that I kind of want to be looking at going forward. It's just, it's, it's like, um, you know, the first step, of course, is just getting people to do it, to do the speech and noise on a regular basis. But then to make sure we develop the right types of speech and noise tests to look at certain things, you know, adults have different needs from kids. You know, if you want an adult disorder, whether it's synaptopathy related or, or cognition related, I think these are going to require different sorts of measures. And we want to teach audiologists and empower them to do that. I mean, we're, we're, we're capable of this. It's just a matter of making sure to do the right tools and knowing how to utilize that information. Does anyone else have any other questions? I have sort of a question. Please. I guess I was wondering what, um, I was wondering whether the speech and noise testing can tell us something more about the auditory system um, than regular um, audi you know, audiological testing. Obviously, yeah. tell us about the cognitive state of the patient and you mentioned that some um, 
patients with cognitive problems will have a, an affected speech and noise. But I'm wondering about things like, for example, the efferent system, because it's supposed to kind of help us in the in a noisy environment and tamp down the noise so we can pay more attention to what we're we want to pay attention to. Is um, do you have any thoughts about that? And is it a way to probe that side of the, our system, which we typically don't even have a, a way to test? And then if so, could that be an early marker of some neurodegeneration or things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel like of all the things that we do audiologically, that some sort of speech and noise measure is going to be the best marker of an early neural degeneration. Okay, I, I do feel that. The question is, the next question is, and so given that, it's like, how precise can we make these tests? And, you know, is it the sort of thing they're going to be like generally sensitive to certain things, whether or not neural degeneration, or whether they're cognitive issue or something else? Or is it sort of thing, or can we really start to dil- drill it down like that, you know? So if I go into hand wavy mode, I kind of sit there and say, okay, what does it take to, to drive the efferent control? Like how much of this is like, is level dependent, you know? So like if we use um, softer signals versus louder signals, maybe if we have a larger or smaller difference in performance between the two, that might be indicative of uh, um, um, less efferent control sort of thing, you know I mean? But that's, I, I, I think I would like to think, you know, the functioning efferent system, we should see, um, um, better speech and noise abilities. Okay. And, and the question is, and, you know, when I showed like that range performance that you see for people with a similar amount of hearing loss, or even with the normal hearing, some of that could very well be like things like efferent control. The question is just, I think, you know, in the long run, you know, like, like, look, I'm using a ton of quicksand. I, I'm not naive enough to think that this is the end all be all. I mean, we're already trying to look at other tests or exploring like what other options, sorts of things we might be able to do to get, to get a better version of it, to kind of get exactly these sorts of issues. Cause I think we're gonna to have to get more sophisticated in how we look at measure these things. So it's possible, but we're not there yet. Any other questions? If not, I'll, 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 I'll thank you for listening. I'll thank you for um, hanging on through my uh, technical glitches and, and uh, um, answering your text while you're on the uh, on the bike you know the whole super shebang so appreciate it